Hello, everyone. My name is Taryn A. Camito, and I'm the Director of Education and Outreach for Nevada Ballet Theater, and I'm pleased to welcome you to our pre-performance program, Insights. Please help me welcome our guest speaker, Mr. Christopher Hurd, the Director of Education for Sarasota Ballet. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Insights. Uh, I'm really excited to be back here again. I I'm actually can't remember how many times I've been here, but it's just wonderful to be back. So um, what you're going to see this evening is a wonderful mix of three fantastic different ballets. Um, I'm going to start, though, by saying how the small the ballet world is. So Sandra Jennings from the Balanchine Trust has been here staging Serenade for the company. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, she was in Sarasota staging theme and variations for us. And Sandy's mother, Jackie Kronzberg, and I used to work together at Boston Ballet. So it's a really small world. So this mixed program brings together three amazing ballets. Now, whether you're new to the ballet or have been a fan for many years, there's something for everyone. Today, you will see the sublime serenade, the joyous Western Symphony by George Balanchine, and then Paul Taylor's fantastic Company B. Now, let's start by looking at George Balanchine. He was the father of American ballet. Without him, we would not be here today, as he introduced this country to the beautiful art form of ballet. Georgi Melantonovich Balanchivatsi was born in 1904 in St. Petersburg into an artistic family. His father was an opera singer and composer and one of the founders of the Tbilisi Opera and Ballet Theater. Balanchine attended the famous Imperial Ballet School in St. Petersburg, where he was a student of Pavel Goethe, who also taught other ballet greats such as Tamara Kasavina, Anna Pavlova, and Vaslav Nijinsky. After joining the Mariinsky Ballet as a professional dancer, Balanchine also enrolled in the Petrograd Conservatory, where he studied advanced piano, music theory, and composition. Balanchine was famed for his musicality, and so we can see that his music studies enabled him to have a deep understanding of the music he would choreograph to. After leaving Russia for Paris, Sergei Diaghilev, one of the most famous ballet impresarios and creator of the Ballet Russe, hired Balanchine as a choreographer in 1924. It was here he created one of his first ballets that is still danced today, Apollo, and that was in 1928. After being dropped amazingly from the Ballet Russe, Balanchine headed to America in 1933. One of his most famous sayings is, but first, a school. He realized that in order for dancers to dance the way he wanted, he had to create a school to train them correctly. And at that time in the US, there was no real formal training, and Balanchine felt the dancers here could not dance well. With the assistance of Lincoln Kirstein and Edward Warburg, the School of American Ballet opened on January the 2nd, 1934. And you can see an image here from the original school. Today, the school is still going, and it's now the official training ground of New York City Ballet, the company Balanchine founded in 1948. The first ballet Balanchine created in the USA was Serenade. It was choreographed for the students of the School of American Ballet as a tool to help them learn how to dance together in a corps de ballet. Now, traditionally, especially in the classical ballets of the 19th century, a corps de ballet had groups of 12, 16, even numbers. However, because Balanchine's school had just started, he had to choreograph for whoever attended his rehearsals. Hence, the opening pose is for 17 ladies. One rehearsal, only nine ladies showed up. There is a section for nine. When a few men joined the class, Balanchine added parts for them. And Balanchine said in an interview years later, I didn't have it in mind to make anything. I just made serenade to show dancers how to be on a stage. Balanchine also kept moments from rehearsal in the ballet. When a girl fell in exhausted frustration, he told her to stay on the floor and made it into the beginning of the final slow movement. Another girl was late to rehearsal, so he incorporated that into the end of the first movement, and you'll see those today. The first performance was scheduled for June the 9th, 1934, at an outdoor makeshift stage at the White Plains estate of the Warburgs. However, that was not its official premiere, as Edward Warburg recounts. We put up a platform on the lawn, which to this day has never recovered. There's still a brown spot on the grass. We hung spotlights from the roof. My poor mother put on a buffet for 200 guests before the event. We had a piano hidden in the bushes. 
The show started. It was the first performance of Serenade. The dancers stood with their arms raised to the moon and the heavens. And the heavens responded with heavy rain. <laughs> no moon. We never got beyond the, the opening theme. Lincoln Kirstein jumped on stage and announced the performance would be held the next night. Mother had to repeat the meal. It was Sunday. Where do you get the food? She said, do you expect me to have? Yes, please, mother. The next night, June 10th, 1934, Serenade went on as scheduled. Now, the picture you'll see here shows the original costumes for Serenade, but later the production was redesigned by Balanchine's popular designer, Karinska. Now, here you'll see the costumes as they are uh, seen today. It also shows the famous opening pose. The ladies are standing, not turned out, but in a natural sixth position of the feet. The right arm is raised, as if shielding the eyes from the moon. The ladies reach the extended hand out and move it over their forehead before bringing the arm down to the preparatory position of the arms. Then the dancers turn out en masse, their legs to first position, the first position we ever learn in a ballet class. From there, the dance begins. Balanchine honed the ballet into the version we know today. What was originally a single lead female role was made into three separate parts, the waltz girl, the Russian girl, and the dark angel. In 1981, which was towards the end of uh, Balanchine's life, while working with principal dancers Karen von Aldringen, Maria Caligari, and Kira Nichols, all of whom had the long flowing hair that Balanchine loved, he spontaneously decided that the lead women would unbind their hair for the ballet's final movement. Now, there's no specific story for Serenade, however, many have tried to find one. Balanchine famously said, see the music, hear the dance. The music for Serenade is by Tchaikovsky, of course, famously uh, composer of Swan Lake, Beauty and the Nutcracker. Balanchine, though, chose a less known work, his Serenade for Strings, Corona, uh, composed sorry, in 1880. The music lends itself so well to the ballet. Balanchine said that Tchaikovsky's spirit guided him every step of the way. I couldn't do it alone, he claimed. I'm not smart enough for it. To make the ballet work better, Balanchine switched the order of the last two movements. Now let's just listen to the very opening of the ballet. Notice the gorgeous strings ringing out and hearing the main theme as we hear the opening of Serenade. <laughs> Stunning, stunning music, and wait till you see the rest of the ballet. Balanchine was a genius. He created so many ballets, and all of them so different. Before we go into Western Symphony, the second ballet by Balanchine that we'll see this evening, I thought we would, it would be interesting to see a short clip uh, with Peter Martins, who is now the current ballet master and chief of, of New York City Ballet, explaining Balanchine's genius. What he did was he took ballet technique and he expanded it, he extended it, he stretched the limits. He was the greatest romantic choreographer I can think of. Then he was a pure classicist. And then he was a modernist. And these ballets were all 
very different. Yet they were all rooted in the classical language. If you look at some of his very modern ballets, like Agon is one ballet that comes to mind, it's all classical ballet steps with a modern twist here and there. Balanson's story is fascinating. He left Russia around the time of the revolution, went to Paris, worked with Diaghilev. That's where he first met Stravinsky and Prokofiev, Matisse, Picasso, that whole world. And then he got an invitation from Lincoln Kirsten, who invited Balanson to come to America. They started a school, School of American Ballet, where he created his first ballet, Serenade, which is now a classic. There was no grassroots balletic organization in America. And then they started a ballet company. And it folded. And there was like three or four precursors. And then finally, Morton Baum invited Balanson and Lincoln to establish the New York City Valley. That was 1948. When it came to Tchaikovsky, you could see him pour his heart out. Balanson told me once, he said, I'm a very sentimental man and I try not to show it in my choreography. He fought it his whole life. Amazing, amazing man. So, and now as Monty Python would say, for something completely different, Western Symphony. Couldn't be further from the luminous serenade. With traditional American melodies and the Wild West as its source, Western Symphony is a toe-tapping and smile-inducing work. It was choreographed in 1954, just six years after the founding of New York City Ballet. At that time, the company was short on money, and so Balanchine had to choreograph works that he hoped would be popular with the audience. Betty Cage, who was the general administrator of the company at that time, recalls, my working relationship with George and Lincoln was not on an artistic level at all. I made financial judgments. This is possible, this is not possible. Or, if you want this very much, we'll try to make it possible. I didn't say you can't do it, it's going to cost too much. Because in those days, the city center was not paying, um, sorry, for new productions, only the company's operating costs. For new productions, we had to raise money outside. If we had money, fine. If we didn't have money, well, we didn't have money. The first year we did Western Symphony, I told Balanchine we didn't have money for either scenery or costumes. He said, that's all right. We'll do it in practice clothes and do it on a bare stage. Later when we have some money, we'll have costumes. And that's what happened. He was wonderful because he always understood the financial limitations. Now, fortunately, the costumes we see today were added the next year, again by Karinska. Balanchine was fascinated with American themes and created several ballets as a tribute to the country he loved. Think of Stars and Stripes, and who cares? In Western Symphony, we're on a rugged Old West street populated by cowboys and dance hall girls. However, the ballet, although somewhat tongue-in-cheek, is very much a classical ballet. You'll see the traditional pas de deux, the corps de ballet, the soloist doing her fouettes, etc. Balanchine infused the classical ballet steps with the formations and gestures of American folk dancing. Here you can see Balanchine with his dancers rehearsing Western Symphony. Now by the look on his face, he's obviously making sure they are taking on his corrections. Oops. This picture shows Tanaquil Leclerc, who was in the original cast of the ballet. The ballet also included Diana Adams, Andre Iglesky, and Jacques D'Amboise. The music was adapted from American classic songs such as Red River Valley, Good Night Ladies, and O oh, Dem Golden Slippers. The musical arrangement is by Hershey Kay, who worked on so many ballets with George Balanchine. Kay also collaborated with Bernstein on Candide and also Andrew Lloyd Webber for Evita. There are three movements. 
The first suggests a saloon, even though we are outdoors. There is a section to look out for called the lobster section, where the boys are facing upstage and the girls are weaving in and out. The second movement has a lonely cowboy strumming his guitar and a woman who is almost like the Swan Queen from Swan Lake. The original third movement is no longer danced. Apparently, the choreography was too hard for the dancers who followed. The final movement suggests Mae West with its lead lady, and you'll see the corps, corps de ballet skipping, and then the entire company closes the ballet in consecutive pirouettes. Very difficult. Originally, the curtain would fall and rise up again to see the dancers still turning, but now it stays down, which I think the dancers appreciate. <laughs> now, the middle ballet on our program is Company B, choreographed by the modern choreographer Paul Taylor. It's danced to music by the Andrews Sisters. And now, before we hear from Rachel Berman, who staged the ballet for Nevada Ballet Theatre, Let's watch a short clip from 1941 of the Andrews Sisters. Hello, all you fellas, all over the world. Greetings from the Andrews Sisters. I'm Patty. I'm Maxine. And I'm Laverne. We're making these bead discs just for you. And along with them, we want to send all our love and kisses. Well, here comes Colonel Bronson. Hello, Colonel. How are Hello. you? Good to Hello, see you Colonel. again. Well, it's nice of you to come, and on behalf of the Special Service Division, I want to thank you for coming here to make these V-Discs today, and to tell you that our records are very, very popular all over the world, but we're getting letters that say something is missing, and they want to hear the Andrews sisters. <laughs> Wonderful. So I know today that Mitch Aaron and his boys are going to give out while you sing for our boys overseas. Well, thank you, Colonel. You sit right over there while we give out with oh, some boogie-woogie bugle boy. How about that, huh? So now I'd like to invite Rachel Berman onto the stage to join me. Please welcome her. Hello. Hello. Be careful with these chairs. It's a bit slippery. Ooh. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> right. So Rachel was in the original cast of Company B. So I'd like to start by asking you, tell us about Paul Taylor and why his works are still so popular. Well, it's just interesting watching this and, and remembering, uh, you know, I've seen these Balanchine Ballets, not only the last few weeks that I've been here, but, you know, in the past, New York City Ballet. Um, we talk about George Balanchine being the, the father of American ballet. Um, we talk about, actually, Paul Taylor, I would think of as the second generation of modern dancers. So, really, he danced with Martha Graham in the, um, in the 50s, um, and uh, she, she is one of the mothers of of American modern dance. So he's like one branch away from the roots of the tree um, and really propelled modern dance forward. Um, he's still around. <laughs> he's 87 years old. Um, he has a company, you know, he's had a company since 1954. Um, there's 16 members of the company, you know, it's a small, it's a small company in, in New York City and they travel the world and they're, they do mainly his works. Now that he is getting older, they've started to bring in outside choreographers, which is, new since I left the company. Um, you know, it really was a single choreographer company, which is, you know, doesn't exist so much anymore. That's right, that's right. <laughs> yeah. So t tell us about... That was fun watching the Andrews it was sisters. Fun. The Andrews was so fun. You know, just to, um, before I forget, Maxine Andrews was still around when um, Paul choreographed Company B, and she was at our premiere in, at City Center in New York, so wow. that was a lot of fun to... Kind of get to know her a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so um, tell us what year was it choreographed? So it was choreographed in uh, 1991. And I like to tell this story too because, again, 16 members of the company, very tight knit. Um, 
probably the average dancer stays about eight to ten years. I stayed a little more than ten um, in the company. And they're just, you know, things go in cycles, and there just happen to be a bunch of people that retired. And so within the first two years um, that I was in the company, you know, so like late 80s, early 90s, there was um, seven of us that were new out of the 16. And um, Paul was actually commissioned by the Houston Ballet to make Company B. So it really was made for a ballet company, but he made it on us. And he kind of wanted to tap into, like, I've got all these new kids. Like, what am I going to do with them? So um, he pulled out his Andrew sisters recordings <laughs> and, uh, and started with Boogie Woogie Bugle, Bugle Boy. That was the first, you know, he started with that solo and then kind of picked different songs. There are nine different songs. Um, the ballet has 10 different sections, but the first song is repeated. Okay. And opening, closing, kind of bookends it. And what was it like working with him? It was, it was great. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was, it was a good career. Um, you know, it's, it's very different than, um, I always think about this when I come to, you know, work with ballet companies in particular. They're so used to different repertory and different choreographers coming in and doing a, a lot of different things and being really versatile. And as, a, as an educator now, I always say, dancers today need to be very versatile in everything. Um, but I had, the opposite experience in a way, <laughs> you know, like when I went into the Paul Taylor Dance Company, I only did one man's choreography. So you get very specialized actually. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's good and bad in many ways, but, um, but I was a part of, I mean, he still is creating work. He makes at least two a year. So I was instrumental in making at least 20 dances while I was there with him. And, and, you know, the more you get to know him, then then you know he knows what you can do and what he can pull out of you and pushes you in different ways and it's just you know and then it becomes like mind melding when you're in the studio do this okay you know you just yeah. know exactly what to do it's, there's no guessing yes. anyway, so. so just in case some of our audience don't know what a stager does can right. you explain your process yes so um so basically nevada ballet theater decides they want to do company b um and like i said it happens to be very popular with ballet companies actually i know beth barbary because we i, I set company b um on oregon ballet theater when she was there so when i moved to las vegas a couple of years ago we were like let's Let's do Company B again, um, and you'll see. It's it's a real, it's a treasure. Um, so anyway, so you know, the ballet company uh, licenses a piece for as many performances as they're going to do, and then um, similar to the Balanchine Trust, although you know we're a little again smaller. Um, Paul Taylor, the Taylor Foundation, decides who you know, who to send, and of course, it was obvious that I was already here and that kind of thing. So basically, I worked with them for the last month. And um, I was kind of working concurrently with Sandy, who was setting serenades. So we were kind of sharing dancers and sharing space and you know, working out the schedules. But I taught them every single step. There are 13 members, um, you know, dancers in the cast of Company B. So I, I taught them all those steps <laughs> and you know, rehearsed them day in and day out. And they are ready. Fantastic. <laughs> um, and do you have, often ballet companies, when they have more than one performance, will have a first cast and a second cast right. or two separate casts. Are there two casts for company B? No, we, I know that was, it was almost heartbreaking because there's so few performances. I really just wanted one cast to like dig into it. So only, I only have that's, one. That's it's also it. different. Um, you'll see in Serenade, there are two casts of just the lead dancers. Um, which is easier sort of to insert <laughs> into Company B. It really is, and most of Paul's works, you'll see there are solos, there are duets, you know, moments when there's only one or two dancers on stage, but it's really an ensemble piece. So there's through lines and people coming in and out, and it's hard to just be like, right. tonight you will do this, because yes, it sure. makes everyone work twice as hard. So it's only one cast. That's okay. <laughs> lucky for them, I guess. Yes, to lucky twice. for That's them. Good. Exactly. Um, exactly. Tell us anything we should look out for in the ballet. Well, um, it, it's a modern dance piece, but it's, I would say it's, it's different than other pieces of Paul Taylor's, like most of his work I did, you know, in, in bare feet, for instance. Um, and um, there was a lot more I was going to say a lot more floor work, things like that. Um, this is a little jazzier. Um, they're wearing jazz shoes, for instance. And, um, and there's a real, there's this modern dance vocabulary, but there's also um, kind of woven in there bits of like the Lindy Hop and what we call the, sh the Sugarfoot and these things that, um, 
you know, again, dances from the 40s that were part of Paul Taylor's era. Um, Paul Taylor is 87, I don't know if I said that. Oh, I think I did. Yeah, he was born in 1930, so he, you know, some of these ballets were made before he started his company. Um, but uh, yeah, so there's, you know, this is really music that he listened to growing up, right? So. Um, is, is there a story? There's some, um, there's various stories. Well, I mean, yes, in, in a way, there's, um, it's reminiscent of World War II, obviously. Um, that's the era, and you'll see soldiers, but they're not, it's not overt. They're not in, like, military wear. Their costumes kind of have a hint of the, you know, soldier, and they do a lot of marching and things like that. You'll see there's, um, what's great about Paul Taylor, when we say this, he, he's very good at melding the dark and the light within, like, one piece, so... There's like the happy, the first song, after the first opening section, there's the Pennsylvania polka. And there's, you know, a couple there, happy-go-lucky, polking around and kind of flirting with each other. And halfway through their dance, there's a line of soldiers like in the back in silhouette, dying on a battlefield, basically. And um, so things like that, there's just like this little like, oh yeah, there, there, war is happening somewhere, wow. you know. We're, ha we're happy at home, but this is happening there. So that kind of weaves throughout. Yeah, you know, and we kind of go in and out of like happy, and then maybe a little poignant. You know, wow. there's a solo woman. Lots to look out for. Yeah, <laughs> yearning for her soldier that's away and things like wow. that. Wow, so excellent. There's a, there's a lot to look out for, and and again, if you have no idea about the Andrews sisters' music, it doesn't matter. You're going to be like toe tapping the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Um, we just have a couple more minutes before we go to the show. Does anyone have any questions for for either of us? You're very quiet out very there. Very shy. Yes. Um, what would you say is your favorite like, section of company? Oh, that's a good question. Um, we did this. I'll just answer by saying we did this piece so much. It really was a hit, um, you know, in instant hit. Again, it was commissioned by Houston Ballet. They actually did the premiere in, like, June of 1991, and we, in October, we premiered it in New York, um, and many ballet companies have done it. Um, I, my original part was, there's a sextet, and this song is called Joseph Joseph, there's three girls and three boys, and the girls are after the boys, <laughs> and, um, and I was like the solo girl, you'll see that one soldier kind of, you know, one boy goes down, and she kind of mourn, mourns him, you know, and so that was my original part, but again, we did this so much that people changed, Paul changed casting, uh, then I did the, the polka for a long time, which I loved, and then um, I actually think my favorite, I did probably longer than the polka, the last duet, it's called There'll Never Be Another You, and it's very, it's a very simple, you know, I don't know, if, are you a dancer? I was gonna say, yeah, you know, as a dancer, sometimes you're like, there's not many steps here, so it's very, very simple and kind of minimal, but it's very heart-wrenching, and I, I liked, um, I liked acting, so that was that was a fun one to do. Excellent. Yes, sir. Were they uh, any relation to the June Taylor dance? <laughs> no. You know how often that we got that no relationship at all. Because I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Paul does have a sister, but not named June. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, Lee. Well, again, I danced with Paul Taylor for, you know, a little more than a decade, and I was instrumental, you know, I was a part of the creation of that work. Um, so I didn't work again with him in staging it, but I have notes, and, you know, I remember steps from being in the room. I mean, you know, some things I still remember. <laughs> it's in my DNA. Um, but also, the beauty of technology now. I mean, I have so many different DVDs from myself dancing it to, I don't know, you know, them dancing it last year at Lincoln Center. So I have many mm -hmm. versions to look at. I think the, the hard part, you know, I have to be true to the piece and to Paul Taylor, but, um, but the fun part <laughs> is that it's kind of like Rachel Berman's take on Company B because I have to make decisions. And, and Paul was very good about um, letting our artistry show through. So, you know, if different people changed parts or, you know, as he created works, you know, or you revived a work that had been done years before, he let you be you within the structure of the piece, so um, I feel very confident, like I, I let these dancers also be themselves and bring different things to it and, you know, 
you want to highlight their strengths. So mm -hmm. that's how. Yeah. That's why it continues. It, it exactly. Continues, it, yes. Exactly. It evolves and continues. One and last question yeah. at the back. How's the original, the original show different from the one we're going to the see original tonight? Company B in particular. Well, again, it's it's Rachel Berman's take on it. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's live performance, so there, these are you know thirteen breathing human beings <laughs> that are you know different than myself and my colleagues. So, again, they're bringing their own artistry to it, and and ballet dancers. I mean, you know, my background. I studied ballet until I you know segued into modern dance, and most of my colleagues did, but but. These are ballet dancers that are trained in a you know specific technique, so they bring that to the table as well. So, you know, they have you know I don't know, good and bad again. <laughs> no, they they've embraced the again the the sort of grounded aspects of this piece, but they also bring you know our bugle boy is first of all he's probably the tallest bugle boy that <laughs> that I that I've ever worked with, but it's very exciting and you know again to see him doing these amazing big jumps as a, as a very tall gentleman. <laughs> excellent. It's exciting. Excellent. Mm. All right, we should probably stop so that we, we, should we go don't to the miss show. the show. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and enjoy tonight's performance. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.